So, and I think that because I translate myself, uh, yeah, you I do. Use, right. So I'm translating from English, and uh, so if you the, the best job that a translator can do is being transparent between the author and the audience. Uh, so if so it means that you you are just transparent, says that you are invisible. Invisible. It, it, the word goes directly, and and the work seems like having been written in the language it is translated. I have the pleasure of introducing poet Luli, Lulita Lushinaku and her translator Ani Jika. She grew up under virtual house arrest because of her family's opposition of the Stalinist di- dictatorship of Enver Hoxha. She was not permitted to attend college or publish her poetry until the weakening and eventual collapse of the communist regime in the early 1900s. 1990s, sorry. Um, she is among the first generation of poets to emerge out of the cultural wasteland of enforced socialist realism in the arts, reinventing Albanian poetry almost entirely from scratch. Her most recent collection, Negative Space, was published a couple of weeks ago in the U.S., In these lines, personal biography disperses into the history of an entire generation that grew up under the oppressive dictatorship of the poet's native Albania. Lushinaku instills ordinary objects and places, gloves, used books, acupuncture needles, small town train stations, with subtle humor and profound insight as a child discovering a world in a grain of sand. Lolita will be joined in conversation with translator of Negative Space, Ani Jika. Thank you, everybody, for coming and uh, I feel like this is a wonderful event to be with Lulieta at the juncture of uh, the publication of her book. I've worked on this with her for years and it's wonderful to finally see it as a real thing in the world. So I am nervous because it feels like we've just given birth now (laughs) and it's official. Um, But yeah, it's great to be here with you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just since we are supposed to uh, to um, create this presentation as a dialogue between me and Tani, so I think <coughs> it was a concept. So that was my joke about nice to meet you. It's like we are meeting each other for the first time, you know, after that communication online or uh, in real, you know, during the process of translation, Mm. something that lasted around uh, two or three years, something like that. Over, yeah, over that. So there were, uh, as Ani explained, uh, this uh, collection uh, includes two books uh, already uh, in published originals, so it's a kind of, you can say, selection, but most of poems are are included here. So there are two books, not one book, you know, Mm. considering the original version. And uh, I met Ani uh, during, uh, for the first time during the presentation of my second book in the United States, which was Child of Nature. I was very impressed by the, her gesture. She came from Boston, you know, ex- uh, uh, exclusively for that reading. To so New York. It, it was in New, New York, York, yeah. It was in New York. And uh, so we, I had a chance to, to meet her in person. And then we, were, uh, we met each other uh, one year after when I was in McDowell Colony. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 19, uh, 2011 or 12, something like that. Had mm-hmm. a lunch together, talked about a lot of things, talked about Albania, talked about literature, talked about families, human life. And uh, I think uh, f- f- gradually I was starting to create kind of uh, uh, let's say human connection with her and uh, kind of understanding that which is very important in um, in such collaboration get to know each other uh, uh, indirectly then I was creating the idea that uh, you know uh, when she offered me to translate my book so is she the right person to do that and uh, and especially uh, Knowing her, seeing her energy, you know, she's very hard worker. She did all that, that <laughs> and she is. It's very important sometimes the, the, the timing, the rhythm of the mm-hmm. persons. I like the person who work with rhythm. They say, that, okay, I'm going to do that and that, and they do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that energy, I said that I like the sparks in your eyes. And some, it was a good <laughs> sign, very positive. And especially that, uh, that communication, that feedback, uh, which uh, when it started professionally, it was accompanied by, let's say, kind of uh, 
that uh, emotional, you know, uh, communication. So I had feedback. She, she not only translated my work, but she also did a comment about that. She <laughs> she expressed what how she per, she perceived it. So mm. I I I didn't understand that I needed that kind of communication. To otherwise, it's just a technical thing. You know, you're talking technical details. Mm. But the thing is that. If you communicate in person with the person who is your translator, the conversation can be totally dry and technical. It's fine because you you can see the feedback, the emotional reaction. Mm. But when you communicate by email, you know it's something else. Though. So you necessarily need you know that kind of I would say flesh, of uh, it's like um, kind of atmosphere. You know you try to cover all this process of dialogue, communication, mm. and feedback. You know. So uh, we, uh, she did the translation, and I'm very happy that uh, uh, everything, uh, let's say, we succeeded to have this book from New Directions. I was supporting my way when she needed me, of course, time to time, when she needed to uh, confirm that she was right in her, uh, uh, let's say, word perception or mm -hmm. words or mm -hmm clarifying something here and there and and she also gave me you know the first uh, draft and the second improved one just to to make sure that everything is uh, in my opinion because I can't judge the, the translation I'm still I'm a foreigner I'm not doing it I can do it do translation myself I have a sense let's say of English and I understand <coughs> and uh, so uh, and who can judge it I mean we we always say when we uh, uh, get a book in translation, we say, oh, it's perfect translation. But we don't know how the original is. So the test is very simple. If in, in the other language the book comes fluent and, and, and we, uh, we don't feel the presence of translation in between, so it means that, uh, that you enjoy the reading, so it means that, yes, of course, it's, it's, it's a very good translation. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that, because I translate myself. Uh, yeah, you I do, use, right. mm -hmm. So I'm translating from English. And uh, so if you, the, the best job that a translator can do is being transparent between the mm -hmm. author and the audience. Uh, so if, so it means that you, you are just transparent in the sense that you are invisible invisible it, it, the word goes directly and and the work seems like having been written in the language it is translated mm -hmm. so uh, I think I uh, uh, to make uh, just to, to finish that summary of a thing I think that uh, Annie did that job and did it well in my opinion but it's not me who does that so um, yeah thank you I it was my my first full collection my, I have translated from um, English to Albanian. Sometimes I would translate from my mother, who is also a poet, and some poet friends I have uh, who are Albanian. So I w that's how I started back in 2001. But I never had um, official, like, I had never really translated poetry and then published it. So not until I started working on Lita's work. Um, so at first I was pretty... Um, insecure or but not not even insecure just I, I would wonder whether um, I would be able to translate well enough because English is not my mother tongue either so I've I've lived in this country 22 years now but um, I was an adult when I came here so it was a challenge but I love her work so much that um, when I encountered it I, I just felt that I needed to share this work with other people and um, I was like, okay, I'm gonna try. At least I started by by translating a few of her poems and then um, showing them to her. And then you know she was writing one book and then she was writing the other one. And a lot of time passed, and we decided to um, work together and um, actually complete the translation. So um, I'm I'm still shocked that we are today at this stage where there's two books in here. Um, I was going to say something that I forgot. <laughs> um, yeah, just maybe. So I'm sorry, there was something else. But I let's go on with dialogue, and then maybe you maybe read a poem or okay. maybe read something. Yeah. Um, do you want to read? Do you, you can read uh, something bigger than us. Okay. 
All right. So I'm going to read the English translation, uh, something bigger than us. Something bigger than us. The Eskimos have numerous different words for snow. The freshly fallen, the stepped on, the aged, the piled up in heaps, the rotten one left over from the previous winter. As if nearsighted, they're able to distinguish different shades of white, the nothingness, the emptiness, the present of an eternity, and the eternity of the present. Where I come from, we have four different words for evening. Funny, but the one that fits best is borrowed from a foreign language, brought over by invaders, not by spice merchants, and it rhymes with lilacs. Where I come from, there's only one word for grief and for water, and both take the form of the containers that hold them, each to their own fate, each to their own grief. The Greeks have four different words for love, like the four stakes of a tent that assure you a spot in this world, if not today, maybe tomorrow. According to anthropologists, until a century ago, my people had no word for love, only a clever, naive doubt. It's something bigger than us, right? A doubt performed with the rhetorical gesture of a king who asks questions and expects answers to arrive only in his dreams. So uh, now then everything is over I mean the process mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, which is your which was the poem you really enjoyed during translation and the opposite which is the poem you really if not hated to translate you know at least not so enjoyable huh. and why it's um, I think the first part is easy because there are so many that I really enjoyed translating. Um, maybe I would pick negative space because I feel like that's the poem where I was most, um, like I took most risks with. Um, it was the most difficult or? It was difficult and, and I also pushed myself with the translation. Uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't just translate word for word or, um, image by image or clause by clause. <laughs> like I wasn't. I, I was faithful, obviously, but there were parts in it where I, um, I felt like I could try something else. And of course, I would always check with Lolita because, like I said, this was the first experience where I was translating someone that I could communicate with. I've translated other people before, and I never really communicated with the authors. Uh, but because I would talk to you, um, and and you also gave positive feedback, I, I felt like, okay, then I can go on and um, keep working on this the way that I thought it, it worked. So maybe I could point out like two two sections from it, uh, negative space. Um, no, it's okay, let's go on with yeah. the conversation. Well, and which is the most uh, easy to... The easiest easier, one? Easier one, yes. Easy poem to translate? Uh, <laughs> Maybe, maybe I love the last one. Can I read the last one, maybe? Um, things I liked about him. No. <laughs> I felt, I, I love this one. No, please. No? So, uh... <laughs> Why not? This is, uh... I, uh so, the, don't you see? We still think in different <laughs> ways, you know? She likes something I don't like so much because I don't think it's one of the poems that represents me. Uh, no, I mean, it was the easiest to translate. Like this well, one. Well, oh, okay. For me, for yes, me, I thought, but, yeah. Uh, but, uh... What I wanted to say is that uh, she uh, picked up me from McDowell Colony, I mean, just uh, three hours ago, and we didn't make oh, any plan yeah. about this conversation at all. <laughs> so uh, we were talking that how we will compose this conversation and said that well, about what we're doing. So, okay, said, let be spontaneous, you know, because don't tell me, uh, we are talking about probably the, the challenges of translation, but don't tell me. I said that we're going to talk about which was the most challenging point for you mm -hmm. and why, you know, most easy one and far, easier one and, 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 
and uh, and why but so uh, for me it's kind of uh, news hearing Ani that uh, let's say negative space was one of the most difficult ones even mm -hmm. also because it was one of the first long poems yeah isn't yeah it? it was yeah uh, yeah. Now probably it's good to make a short introduction about Negative Space, the poem which gives the, the name, the title to the book. Uh, this poem is uh, started as a auto autobiographical one. I started, I thought, okay, now when you become 50, you think that you have a personal story to tell, you know. <laughs> so uh, I think that I was, I all the time was kind of, let's say, provoked to write such a thing, but you never are sure, do you have a story to tell, you know, to make uh, it's so autobiographical one. So, okay, I started with some element of childhood and uh, and especially uh, how it started. It started from a, a, s a simple detail, banal detail. I remember uh, from when I was in, in elementary school, I remember always the floor of the school was wet during mid between the classes. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a frustrating situation. And, and those uh, cleaning ladies who, at the moment we are went out of the classrooms, you know, she said, don't touch it, don't walk, you know, it's wet. I said, why? She always does the, that the at janitors, the wrong moment. Yeah. The janitors, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so uh, it's like, see, she was, uh, she was, uh, let's say, kind of anger with her life, and it's like that all that anger was uh, directed at you. Yeah, yeah. at, at mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. So, but all this gave me a kind of, you know, bad sensation, anxiety. The wet floor, which was white and uh, black uh, tiles. Tiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, the same uh, thing, uh, the same thing, don't, 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 but don't, don't was a refrain in our life. Mm -hmm. I lived in a I, I have to to tell the same story. We lived. Uh, I lived in an ex-communist country, so it, uh, the the regime there in Albania lasted 47 years, which means almost five decades. So, uh, don't was a, an, a golden formula for the countries who lived, you know, in totalitarian regimes, which means don't doing, don't speaking, don't hearing, don't making any comment. So that don't inactivity, you know, uh, or passivity would be the only way to survive, to remain alive. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine what was uh, the destiny of persons who uh, had that kind of indiv individuality or courage or f forget the protest, you know, even those persons who were in prison there were not in prison because they really were uh, active against the regime, but the regime used them as a model to keep under pressure the rest of the population. So uh, the, uh, the jails in Albania, political prisons, were full of uh, thousands of people. And Albania is only three million people. Can you imagine? I'm talking for thousand prisoners. And uh, many other thousands who, which were deported or internated in international internment camps. And uh, so uh, I'm trying just to bring you uh, a kind of distant atmosphere about the reality this poem talks about. Mm -hmm. So this poem started as uh, my own, you know, biography, and gradually I could uh, I could understand that reveal that it's not my biography anymore. It, it's biography of everybody there. And it's not by accident because I just talked about individuality. So in a country where the individuality didn't exist, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. so how you can talk about your own life, the, the pro, your own profile, your own history, it didn't exist. In another book, I have another poem, short poem, which is called uh, The Hessen to Die. Mm -hmm. And I there, I um, this is about my the the generation of my parents and uh, and each time someone dies you know they die in everybody dies with them it's like those uh, dog slides in uh, the hus huskies in the in, sleigh sleigh in uh, dog sleigh uh, sorry so, which are tied sleigh. to each other so if one uh, falls down all of them would fall together because like everything their existence had a meaning only as as, like as everybody connection had the same between fate. each other Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. otherwise they didn't exist as individuals, they mm -hmm. didn't have a life as individuals. So that's why with that generation, you know, that uh, collective fate, let's mm -hmm. say, collective fate was very important. So, so that's the poem indeed, it's, it's, it's the autobiography of my generation. I'm born on 68, mm -hmm. so exactly at the top uh, peak of uh, cultural re revolution, for those who know uh, 
which what culture revolution was. Probably you have any idea information from China or Mao Zedong. So it was the the probably the the, the great the biggest regression in Albanian history of communism. And uh, and then this is uh, exactly this is a biography of my generation. What happened? But uh, from different. Uh, point of views, you know, and different aspects of that uh, reality. Um, I wanted to ask you, as a translator, um, if, if you can talk a little bit about where you felt that maybe what I translated was something that you, that made you, that you felt satisfied, like it was like something that I found in the translation, and where you felt like, oh, we lost something here. Did you ever feel like that? Did I found something edit and it something lost, you know. Something, uh, sorry, something edit. Edit. Uh, ed, ed. Oh, added, yes. Gained. Yes. Yeah, gained, yeah, gained. Sorry, right, yeah. right. Okay. Gate is the right word, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, for example, uh, yeah, uh, English itself is more poetical than my language is. Mm -hmm. Uh, because these the, are the grammar forms which uh, in Albanian are uh, longer, like in Italian, and more boring and less poetical. You know, Lots of clauses yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and words, prepositions. No words, and you know, it's just kind of those compositions. So English itself, without the contribution of Ani, <laughs> it's, uh, it's more poetical than my language. And lines look shorter, which means, you know, and the, the, the tempo, you know, the pace and everything, it's more. But uh, what uh, else is in, um, in, which is also an attribution to English language, is that you can eliminate the verbs, you know, you eliminate in English. You just, this is like uh, the s sky, or or the plane departed. We can't say in Albanian. We have to use that is necessarily. But verbs are still not very poetical. Mm -hmm. So let's say this is attribution to English grammar, and uh, words are short. Shorter the words are better. It is. But what Ani did is, uh, for example, sometimes she did something which Im let I can say that improved the original. She uh, brought some. For example, is koliva is a kind of. She did it. It's not in the original. <laughs> It's kind of meal uh, the, that uh, the Catholics do. The, yeah. So in during a funeral, uh, they in the Catholic Church they offer. Um, I think it's boiled wheat, um, and it, in Greek it's right. It's koliva. Yeah. So actually, in the original, there's a doesn't a, exist. A in is kind in the original, yeah. the passage says um, uh, whispered names, dates, and shivering wheat, like a wheat field. But when I was reading it and translating, sometimes I get so excited with uh, the imagery or what what the poem is saying. So I'm like, I'm translating it kind of fast, and and, and then I I kind of read some things into it that maybe are not there. And that this was a moment where I I read the wheat shivering, but I in my head I saw uh, koliva, which is what I what I know from church, um, and it is a poem about a funeral, and so that's my impression was that, oh, okay, uh, people are sitting around um, in church and then they're, they're hearing the whispered names of the dead or, and then they're, what they're holding is uh, koliva, the cup with uh, the boiled wheat and, and it's, shiv it's quivering, I think that's what I translated it as, quivering, kol koliva quivering in paper cups. Yeah. And uh, then, I didn't finish yeah. with your merits. Yeah. So what she did, which is the most impressive thing, is that she adapted the idioms, you know. They look very vivid, you know. She she adapted the uh, Al uh, Albanian uh, idioms sometimes in English idioms, which are uh, stronger sometimes in, in English. So which mm -hmm. is, because I also uh, consider that that idiomatic part of translation is very, very important, you know. Or even sometimes you can, if you can replace the liter form in an idiom, you have a double effect. So she did it, and uh, and also she, uh, what I would say, that kind of loyalty in keeping the tone, you know, or uh, conversational, you know, which is time to time, you know, having the same effect it does it have in original. So it looks the same um, natural and spontaneous, you know, like uh, <coughs> uh, like the original version. And but the poem I uh, because. I in intervened, you know, because I didn't want to miss this part because it's very okay. important. Yeah. Thank you. 
And uh, one poem, it's, uh, it's especially, I don't think it had difficulty and uh, because there is a word which doesn't exist, you know, in English, like, you know, when you can say that how it doesn't exist in English, you know, but it's not the same. Even you find, you know, kind of... Uh, <coughs> which one? Synonyms. It's uh, uh, the return of uh, Menelao. Mm. So uh, in this case, uh, we try to, but not, none of them fit exactly uh, the same, you know... The uh, last line? The last line of stanza. the poem? The last stanza. The last yeah. stanza mm -hmm. So I had to then to to uh, to change the last stanza, you know, because I thought I knew that it was untrace untranslatable. Mm -hmm. It happens, you know. Not everything is translatable. Yeah. So this is a poem I, I have kind of let's say, you know, but uh, but you always, I mean, when you convert something in something else, and. Uh, so there is always something you can't cover entirely and, mm -hmm. and it's part, but I'm talking only for one stanza <laughs> in this book. Really? <laughs> so no. it's, it's also a compliment. And, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about this one uh, image that I kind of added. I added it and I wonder if it was um, too much or if you felt like it was... Kuliva? No, the... the, the the one in negative space, the baleen of darkness. So the moment where you're talking about the mouth of black and white tiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was reading that passage and uh, I imagined the tile floor is in the original and it's like a mouth of broken teeth. And um, maybe I went too far, I don't know, but I I brought that other image of a, a baleen of darkness because I was thinking of a big whale, the big the mouth. Baleen is a big whale. Yeah, the big mouth of a, of a whale. Uh, because it has those tiny, um, I don't know what they're called actually in English, the baleen itself. <laughs> uh, because the poem talks about fates, human fates being, uh, actually I should read actually that, just that passage because it's um, so difficult for yeah, me to... So to uh, you talk are, about you the are image. trying to say that he has uh, a, a toothless mouth of an so old person. Yeah, I'll just read it. And you it. put that, that of a whale, yes? Right, but let me Which just... enlarge that uh, effect is supposed to, you know, empower yeah. the effect of Right, that. right. Yeah, for me it sounds, you know... Yeah, I'm just going to okay. read it so because it's so complex um, so that you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so it's just... Uh, just one stanza. So, with a piece of cloth wrapped on the end of a stick, the janitor casually extends the negative space of the black and white tiled floor like a mouth of broken teeth, a baleen of darkness sieving out new human destinies. So, I'm just wondering, was that too much? Or did you Do think... Do you feel it is too much? <laughs> okay, we can ask them. Um, a baleen of darkness sieving out new human destinies. So... I don't know. Um, I I felt like wow. I was excited to discover that image um, through the going back and forth from English to Albanian. I don't know how you it felt. It can take a long conversation because it's which is more intensive, you know, uh, a broken broken right. teeth of uh, old or violently. You know, it depends. Mm -hmm. You know, so if we start this conversation, we need we can everybody write a whole to book. include on that. Okay. So. True. So uh, for me, it's okay, you know, yeah, yeah. it doesn't, uh, only it gains something, it doesn't lose anything. Okay. But uh, to go on with conversation, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that uh, I, um, I, I worried in the beginning is that Ani is uh, half of, more than half of uh, her life is spent in the United States. So mm -hmm. she's more American in the, than Albanian. So, and uh, language is very flexible, language changes very fast. So one of the things is, was that what is Ani capable to understand the slant of Albania, of, let's say, of uh, uh, 2015, you know, mm -hmm. from from the the slant or language of Albania when 
of 97, six, when, yeah. six, when mm. she left. Because a lot of things, all these political and historical processes, you know, which happened in the meantime mm. there, and also the opening of gates, let's say the globalization, mm. and how the, uh, the individual culture transformed the, the imported uh, elements in, into their language. So it's an entire process of, uh, you know, transformation. <laughs> and especially, uh, I worried if Ani would be uh, she, since she was a child when or uh, very young and was not directly attacked by communist regime, would she understand the slant of communism, you know, mm -hmm. in Albania? When I'm talking about the slant of communism, I mean that there is a kind of terminology that uh, you can't understand, you know, like, for example, ag agitation and propaganda, you know, mm -hmm. propaganda, which mm -hmm. was that, uh, that uh, famous, he says, that, that hor horrible law which, uh, 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 with which everybody was punished, you know, uh, politically. So it was 10 years. 10 years itself is a slant, you know, when you say, oh, oh, they cut the 10 years for you, which means, you know, that you are going to be, you mm. know, sentenced mm -hmm. politically. Or the uh, red corner. You heard the term red corner from a movie which is from uh, uh, Richard Gere, he played in China. Red corner was a corner of propaganda and communism, you know. And all these, uh, uh, you know, these denigration processes and, and and other things. So, but even the book doesn't have those because I was careful thinking that it can be translated not to be very specific in mm -hmm. this uh, mm -hmm. uh, common terminology, yeah, mm -hmm. political slant or mm -hmm. typical Albanian communist slant. Still, I didn't know that how Ani will feel, and especially about the objects. Mm -hmm. do, do you want me to go or you want no to? yeah which, which ones no which which objects do you or for example, example i use some uh, words there which can be archaic for example nalanet you know oh yeah okay so uh, i i i think i translated that as galoshes or, or right? brisco you know uh the uh, razor yeah of, uh, that I, forget, old -fashioned razor I forget the english used once you know old-fashioned razors cutthroat razor i think Oh, uh, yeah. So I had to ask her, like, okay, what does this mean? So even though it's an Albanian word, but and I, Albanian is my native, my mother tongue, but still, I wouldn't have known that. Yeah. Yeah, I, would, I had to ask you. Otherwise, I wouldn't know how to keep going. <laughs> no, but, okay. Uh, okay, you, we, you can say that we live in the epoch of Google, and you know, you, <laughs> you can check and find, you know, something even no, with the... Really? You 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 were good at that. Like you would, yeah, you'd come back and tell me. Yeah, try yeah. something in English. Mm -hmm. But what I was talking about is that um, uh, was it difficult for you because Anne is very uh, precise in that that she never translates something that she's not one hundred percent sure she understands it. You know, mm -hmm. which is very I consider very positive in um, for a translator. So what I was talking about is that. Um, mm -hmm. The, this part of this book and what I am going with uh, during this period is about uh, the object, the history of objects uh, in, in poetical form, which, uh, okay, you say that this is not a new thing, it's not a new thing at all. A lot of works, you know, thousands of things are done about the objects. The thing is that what I want to bring is that bringing the, that communist typology through the objects. Which is the difference? The, the difference is that, uh, I mean, the objects have uh, are have different significance in in different cultures. But in Eastern Europe, I'm not talking about Albania, where that uh, simplicity of life you can call it poverty, <laughs> so uh, made that uh, gave a longer life to objects. Which means mm -hmm. that we didn't throw, we didn't throw. Mm -hmm. So we we. Because it was very expensive uh, having those those a few objects, which be furnitures, you know, everyday objects, you know, personal objects, and very rare personal objects, as I just mentioned that. So uh, that they we they had a long life among us. But if the objects have a long life among you, they become like human beings, like souls, mm -hmm. because they are a part of your history. And sometimes I even doubt which were more important, the objects or us, you know? <laughs> uh, 
For example, for example, the scissors. We have only a pair of scissors, and you should be very careful where to put them. They have their place because they have to be used by everybody for everything. Mm. Cutting hair. Oh, the yeah. poem is yeah, scissors yeah. here. Well, uh, cutting we don't papers. have it here. I think I think the scissors. We don't have this. Oh, you don't have it. Okay, no, whatever. No, but yeah. But just as but yeah, phenomenon. that's a great poem too. Yes, yeah. And and, uh, and sim metaphorically cutting the tongue in the mm. sense that don 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 right, right. so or uh, here is a poem uh, uh, called uh, named that uh, inside the suitcase mm -hmm. suitcase was uh, a luggage of my childhood it was wooden i don't know if you ever saw wooden luggage in your life mm -hmm. so it's it belongs to it, it was in my uh, f uh, house since probably years 50 or something like that it was only one. We had to use the same one. So it was a big one, wooden one. And it always reminded me uh, my first departure leave uh, from house when I left Laos for, for the first time. I was in, I was going somewhere in seaside in a, in a children camp or something like that. I was alone. I was in a bus and um, I had to, my luggage, which was that luggage. The thing is that it was big luggage for all the objects of a child. So it was only partly full. Mm. So uh, only those few things, what you could have. And, uh, and I remember that when the bus was moving, that uh, suitcase moved up and down, making such a terrible noise. Because if it's empty... <laughs> Maybe I should, should I read this? I want to read this. Yes, but yeah. let me explain and well, all that. So okay. uh, it was... Um, a, and it was like I was deconspired. It was kind of deconspiration. It's like everybody knew that in my luggage was nothing, only a few things. Mm -hmm. So I, I was embarrassed by that. I was humiliated by that. And, and then I treated this object, which means a lot about my childhood and the environment mm. in a different context you know, as opposite what I do today. I fake my history. I fill my luggage with things that full, full, full. And most of them I never use, you know. It's like I'm still afraid of that emptiness, you know, of my luggage of my childhood. So it's just, these are the games you can do with a, a, the image, which is a symbol mm. very significant about your childhood. Mm. So yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna read it. I'll, I'll read uh, Inside a Suitcase. <coughs> The first time I traveled by bus, it was June. Torrents of rain and vomit streamed across the window, fastening the landscape to my mind with paper clips. Inside the wooden suitcase between my knees, a few things rattled as they slid from one side to the other. There was no bigger shame. The whole world knew what I was carrying. I took that same journey many times. In fact, it went even farther, my own skin turning into a suitcase, packed full with things, as if relocating to another life. Cotton things, synthetic things, truths, alibis, objects and shadows, without the terror of the rattling emptiness. If I try to remove certain things to get below the weight limit, my skin thins, droops, withers, as if due to an extreme diet, and after each return, unused things fill other spaces, in my shelves, drawers, and imagination. Only a few of them remain under my skin all year long. But where can the knees of that nine-year-old be found? Where are the brave sphinxes who protected that suitcase, that small little empire of wood? But the paradox is that uh, Andy and I was talking about that poverty, simplicity, uh, minimalism. The paradox is that uh, the people of Eastern Europe spoke three languages. You know, they, we read a lot. We mm -hmm. talked about everything. I mean, we are so poor. We even didn't know if we'll be alive tomorrow. But we, we talk about culture politics. We knew much more about political. Uh, about American politics that you knew that you were living here. <laughs> so we were all we were starving. We were so uh, hungry, you know, <laughs> to know. You know, knowledge was very important. All this way of compensation, what it was not offered to us, you know, of that uh, isolation and, and non opportunities and, and the limited, you know, uh, conditions, movement, and then, so that's the, or we talked about philosophy, you know, can you imagine, you know, how these mm -hmm. people, we talked about those things. Now, no, we don't know that anymore. So it was a, a kind of, 
a respectful living style in somehow, you mm -hmm. know, in some in some ways. Um, I, okay, I'll, I'll ask another question. How does how does your because you speak English, so how does your poetry sound to you when you hear it in English now? Is the uh, probably the best um, the best way the best thing is that when you you enjoy that like being of somebody else. Mm -hmm. I it looks like it's another voice, another something. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of news for my ear, you know, and I enjoy that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and different languages have different temperaments. Mm -hmm. When I hear my poem, for example, in German language, mm -hmm. you know, it's like. Um, it's psychologically, you know, it has something else. We have here a translator, you know, a German translator, a German American, and it's like uh, in German they are more. Uh, it's it's like in English they leave an open gate, you know. Mm -hmm. In German it's like everything is defined, you know. It's mm -hmm. that inner sound of German, and uh, which is very respectful, you know, in itself, you know, and it's like uh, it's like everything is set, you know, and you can't change anything anymore. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm talking about you know perceiving from outside you know, the effect of sound, how the mm -hmm. the, the uh, my poems look in other language, like not being mine at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I I love um, Lulita's way of arguing. Like there's a, her poems are built around arguments, and so I try to preserve that in the English translation. So there are some lines or particular poems like. Um, uh, cities or gloves where the line some of the lines are longer than others and um, I would think okay maybe I should just cut this line here but because I hear her voice in Albanian and I, I understand what she's doing with those line breaks I followed that in the English version because I um, I feel like if I if I do that then in English you can actually hear her voice um, rather than creating new line breaks like some people would you think is it doesn't lose anything? No? I I mean I hope I hope not. Yeah, mm -hmm. we we'll have to hear maybe from people in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I in my from my instinct I felt like I should preserve the line breaks m most of the time. Like s there were a few times where I had to maybe break because it looked funny on the page. But typically I would preserve it. But because in original it's 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 intentional. It's not an, an right. accident. Yeah. So. Right. Uh, if I want to give a, a narrative mm -hmm. flow to the uh, to the poem, right. it means that it's a choice. So, right. so it's intentional. It's not mm -hmm. by accident. Mm -hmm. So I want that that flow to give you that that let's say we perceive we hear in different ways a story <laughs> and a poem. It's it's, it's absolutely it give you that kind of comfort you know and you know, everything takes the time and and the rhythm is is racing gradually so that's I do in in my language and w that's why some poems have very long lines you know very very long and some are very short when I want to leave some space in between to think between lines but when it's narrative and uh, you know it's it's important to read in one breath you know so that's I do and Annie I'm very very grateful to her because she understood you know why and and respected that you know I say why I did that and and still kept it you know save the the last the first form thank you um is it maybe time for questions or yeah okay um i don't know if anybody has any questions for either lulieta or me you can. and i guess i would also just see if did you have any feeling when you translated into french how what was your you described nicely how it was in german and how it is uh, english is, is poetic how, how is it in French? But this is a beautiful question. The thing is that a book just came out, it's one in French, and I didn't hear it yet, I only saw, and I don't speak any word in French, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but when I was in presentation in these countries, I heard in German a lot of times, I heard in Polish, I heard in English more than, as, but I didn't hear that in, in French yet. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, I, I never, I, I was in France, but not yet for my book. So I, I need to hear from a French, you know, to, to recite that. But uh, yes. Um, you've, somehow you brought out the idea for me of language as music. 
in the spoken form because you're speaking, you're talking about the audible sense, the oral and audible. Can you comment on that for English and Albanian or any other language? How, what did you think about that when you were, how did you think about that when you were translating? Um, so her poetry is narrative, mm -hmm. and uh, I also write the same way. Uh, there's not much uh, rhyming, uh, but there is there is a rhythm to her narrative style. So I could hear I can hear her telling the story, and um, I try to follow the cadences that way in the English version as well. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking of the word cadence. cadence yeah. For Right. So I don't know if that answers the question, but it, I, I felt that it, it was it was easier to translate um, this kind of poetry because I write similarly, um, and so it's like you're telling someone a story and. Uh, it, that was the template, the narrative. Yeah. And there, the the rhyme would be mostly internal rhymes. Um, obviously, you think about word choice a lot. So if a word sounds really hard at the end of the line uh, and it, it doesn't have that effect in the original, then I would think over the choice uh, to make that, it reflect uh, the original. Very interesting because th this is a choice too. This is intentional because I. I do that that very invisible rhyme or inner rhyme because I don't want the attention to go to the musicality. So mm -hmm. this is a tool, an instrument. I want uh, I want it to concentrate on the image and metaphor and the meaning. If I do that your know, musicality, which formally it sounds beautiful, it's mm -hmm. like you know, you are going to, I'm going to deconcentrate from the essence of the thing. The topic. So mm -hmm. I, I never did, I, I, first time I did, I, I wrote the same way from the beginning. It came as an instinct, you know, I, I decided right away, this is the way I want to write. Mm -hmm. But then you, in years, you try to understand that we, why you never try, you know, which is kind of scrupulous thing to do and, mm -hmm. and syllables, you know, measuring and giving a, a, a strict structure, formal structure. But I don't want to do that as a thing. And, and I felt for me that I didn't want to do that because I wanted something else. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, clothes, you know. Mm -hmm. how it's do you like, pick, uh, yeah. How do you so pick them? You, it's, it's where you want the tension, you want it here, here, here. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it's, it's yeah, it's, it looks like uh, everything is so spontaneous. Now it's not spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Ani, when you're translating, uh, do, you, do you think of, uh, what your priorities are, um, like being loyal to Julieta, uh, to the Albanian, to the English. Um, I mean, I'm sure every word is a choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about um, that process? Of yeah. Yeah. So I, I I typically begin by reading the original, making sure I understand what is the message here, um, and then. I pay attention to figurative language because that is typically the hardest to come across, um, especially if it's simile. There are similes, and sh uh, Lolita's similes are very complex and beautiful and original. And so, can I bring those as originally in English? That's a very big challenge sometimes uh, for but some poems. Our so editor doesn't like so much, you know. Uh -huh. Ani is careful and. Uh, <laughs> And she she doesn't want to eliminate those like like like. Right. Well. Oh, that's right. So yeah, the so um, but the editor had suggested that I should cut some of the likes uh, and turn them into metaphors and um, just Assimilate for more variety, I guess. Text. And and we did cut some, but still the the way that she builds the simile is what's important. And and we, I I mean I try to uh, keep that even though we cut some of the likes, the word like. I don't know why it sounds anesthetical in our time, you know, the repetition it used to um, be, which is similar, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, when I wanted to use like, 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 it sounds that, yeah, it's kind of anesthetical. So mm -hmm. if you can eliminate that, you should eliminate that. Mm -hmm. It's painful sometimes, we have right. to do, because when the editor says they know better, <laughs> she doesn't, she's very careful, she doesn't want to cut, you know, neither no. me, 
but uh, yes, it's uh, we have to, and we eliminated some of them. And mm -hmm. there, but there is a significant difference between a simile and a metaphor, right? Because the simile is t Direct, tells us yeah. what it does, mm -hmm. and that, that's a different poetical the stance. The tone changes. The and it's not. It's, yeah. it's not. And it's sort of like I. I think people like to think of metaphors as being more poetical. Metaphors. Yes, mm -hmm. but it, it's not. Like a simile is a very. It's a. It shows its rhetoric. Rhetoricity, whatever you want to say about it, but it's it's so sort of like so it's mo so I don't think it's quite it's not straightforward or mm -hmm. it, you lose something if you cut a simile or you right. turn it into a metaphor. You do, yeah, yeah. But we we had to consider okay which ones it's worth it to cut and yeah. which one it, it's not. But um, yeah. But to answer your question, so I feel like I would begin with understanding first the text and then um, working from a, a passage of energy, like where, where the image is most complex or the, um, the message which sometimes can be philosophical. Um, I need to render that into English in a similar way. So I, I work from like the center or the place of energy and then worry about the rest because the rest is easier and kind of comes together on its own. Um. Um, I know you teach translation mm -hmm. and uh, after this amazing experience <laughs> how would you revisit your method of teaching translation or uh, what are the major takes from that experience? Yeah so I, I feel like I learned so much about translation through this book uh, working on this book so um, perhaps I would teach um, how, how you approach uh, working with diction in a different way, um, how to be more patient with the translation instead of, uh, if you know the native or the original language, you can get really excited um, and begin to translate kind of automatically because you know the original and you also know the other language if you're that kind of student. Um, but you need to be more patient and, and um, stop and like zoom out and um, think about okay is everything coming through or are you too um, eager to to arrive at <laughs> I don't know if I'm if I'm saying this clearly enough but I would really ask for the student to have more patience with the translation yeah. we well, also have to create a poem in English and that yeah yeah it is very much like writing I mean, translation is writing, and it's part of the revision process. So in a way, I feel like translating this book has made me a better writer because it's made me more aware of the process of revision and what goes on to it, um, and more patience with it <laughs> as well. Yes? Uh, how has the process of collaborating with Ani and working across the border of language um, affected your own writing now, the, the work you're doing now, your current poetry? It's a good question because not only now, but very interesting because I think that the process of translation helped me to revise even the poems which are already published because it reveals some the problems of the original the original text so us out don't worry about you know in your language but when translator is making you some questions you know clarifying something <laughs> you already did that here you could you know you could uh, you, you understand that you could express it in another way or something you have to cut something it's too much you know <laughs> so it's during that process during the process of translation through her <coughs> intervention and question Annie helped me to revise my own work so and we in agreement we decided you know to have a revision uh, form of uh, poems you know so we revised that during the process mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, after that it's uh, I'm not aware, you know, that that uh, because I also am reading all the time in English, and yeah. probably what I read from the others have much more impact, you know, on me than my own work. I'm not going to read my. I hate my own work. Then, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so yeah, it's it's kind of influence, but not that. Mm. But probably uh, being uh, all this improvement of grammar and trying, you know, mm. to eliminate some 
something which revealed, you mm -hmm. know, were revealed during this process in my in my uh, structure or other things that mm -hmm. I'll I'll understand that during, you know, when I have done mm -hmm. many more poems by mm -hmm. after that. And the gentleman there, it's... Uh, Do you find yourself thinking in, in different ways and writing <laughs> using different imagery because the political system that oppressed you for so long has, has left? Or has it, unfortunately, perhaps, you think it's like tainted your consciousness going forward? Or how, how do you approach life now mm -hmm. With yes. a different... Yes, it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. The thing is that, um, so um, now it's already 27 uh, years, almost three decades after the re regime fell. Mm -hmm. So in this book, you can find more political poems about communism than in my previous books. Mm -hmm. So indeed of going to get reduced, it's just becoming stronger, you know, mm -hmm. that impact of the past, you know, communist pact. The thing is that uh, it's it's not a, a, a choice. Uh, the thing is that I and me, some writers, several from my generation, they still go back to that. And it, the more time passes, more their effort to the past. And I'm trying to explain that what happens, why this process, is that nostalgia? Nobody of us is nostalgic about the time <laughs> because it was nightmare. We mm -hmm. probably need a kind of distance of time, you know, to look clearly at the past. Mm -hmm. So uh, we still refer to that reality because it has something very sp special, unique, authenticity. You mm -hmm. know, that reality being uh, isolated itself as culture, as political system, as social system, was atypical, you know, was mm -hmm. special, was original in every element. Some of the elements I just mentioned here. And another thing is that uh, that uh, living in, in extreme conditions under pressure, uh, let's say, provoked the best part and the worst part of the people. So which means that, that p during that period we had heroes and victims, you know, and let's say uh, bad people. So it was simply people were categorized, you know, good, bad, that's it, mm -hmm. nothing in between. So which means that for some it was the meaning of life, resistance, you know, to resist against the regime. Like you could see in Czechoslovakia, they still make comments about that guy was a kind of, uh, how do you say, uh, he was against the regime, you know, he was brave, and the other one was collaborator with, you know, secret service and other things. So it means that that regime was uh, kind of, uh, it, uh, it categorized the people, it was divided, you know, and, and also gave some significance to our living in such condition where nothing, you know, worthy. Mm -hmm. So kind of meaning, kind of context. But... Uh, uh, as I said, that now in distance we see to the to the past, but we see in more analytical way and more quiet and more cold. Mm -hmm. So I, I was not the the first direct uh, poem I ever wrote in my life is this book. It's about that uh, communist uh, political prisons and tortures, you know, and execution and other things. Uh, it's in this book, and this water and carbon is direct. The only one I had, so it's now, it's late. Because I needed time, you know. Uh, when you are v very close to something, you are still very passionate about that. And you can't write when you are passionate. So wh I, I decided to do that when it was the right moment. And I had to ask myself why I am writing that and how, this is very important, how to write that. Am I going to tell a story that everybody knows? So you have to find the approach, how? Which is the idea, what you want to tell? And I did, I, I told that story, you know, in, of course, it, it's inside that uh, political, um, let's say, criteria, you know, finally, the political, you know, uh, space, so as, as a poem. But I write it from them from perspective of human dignity, mm -hmm. as kind of, uh, contradiction of materialism, which was the base of Marxism and Leninism, you know, considering the human being as material creator, it's like a table, you know, just a piece of meat, and idealism, you know, what is human being, you know, it's a soul, it's a character, what is that? So, at the moment I created the, the, the needful, you know, distance from the past, and see everything in a in clear sight, and make the analysis, and found the approach to that, I, I wrote that. So even the distance, instead of, uh, let's say, uh, um, trying to make us l 
forgetting that, just trying to look with a rational eye, you know, to the past. Mm -hmm. I think that must be for pragmatical reasons, of course, you know, that to say that we are going to. Uh, uh, m most of writers do that, you know, for because we are selling an exotic case, you know, an exotic story. The Western countries don't know what happened in communist countries, you know. Uh, we, it's it looks like uh, oh, what it's it's business. Every I mean, this is a big market, you know. A lot of books, thousand books, are published during the years, you know. It can be also sensational, you know news, that kind of novel talking about what happens in Russian gulags, you know, or in camps here, or, or in Kosovo, you know, with on those ethnic, you know, wars, and which which uh, are, represent something new, are news, you know, for the readers of, uh, you know, West. Mm -hmm. But uh, mostly it's because uh, is that you really want to tell a story because it's not a decision, but it comes, you know, surfaces. I started to write a story about how I f fill my life with fake things, you know, just manipulate my life as that luggage, full of the clothes, the things I never use. It's like I am afraid to face that reality that it's me. Life is very simple, two or three things. Why you create the illusion, you know, that uh, this and this and this and this. And suddenly I found myself comparing that with the luggage of childhood. So it just accidentally surfaced, you know. Mm. So it creating that opposition, what is that? I had only that and I was proud mm -hmm. of that, that mm -hmm. luggage with nothing inside and now I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. I'm much more mm -hmm. a coward than a child, you know, who <laughs> had that, that uh, suitcase, you know, mm -hmm. between legs. D did I explain, sorry, you know, clearly? Mm -hmm. <coughs> For me, it's a morality. It's an European part that I have to say that I duke filluar nga mbulimi pjesëve intime. Popu i të tjerë kanë qenë më me fat. Morali u ka ardhur i gatshëm nga lart. I shkruar në plaka guri. Ati ku unë jam rritur, morali kishte form, trup e emër. Një kain, një Maria Magdalene papenduar, një Ruth, Dalila, Rachel. Morali të regoj letësisht me gisht me, me bojt një shtatë vjeqari. Shembuit për kryur vesi e virtyti, Ati ku ka el shon bezen bi moçal. Kështu pra, psimet e parat moralit i mora pa i përtypur. Si shurup për kol, zdo jo tjetër ishte ma abstrakte në një qatit i gulthyr. Dhe sigurisht ata që ata së të zhgënjeni nësë në breznin e dyt, pasar si të tyre ishi një tjetër kain, një tjetër ruth, një tjetër Maria Magdalen, që nuk rriteshin. Klishia ishi një kosisht reziku dhe mbrojtja për ta, si do bore thath për iglot e skimeze. Ta një di shumë më tepër për morali, ma di mund të jemi moraliste me gishën të regu si pjesë të retorikës, për pare ferecë, që bëm e ta? Një deru hapë pa dashje, drita qaun me forcë, dhe si në një laborator filmi, ajo shkërmoj që i portretet e tyre në bromi, bromi d'argenti. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Children of morality. It was the Europeans who taught indigenous people shame, beginning with the covering up of intimate parts. Other civilizations were luckier. Morality was handed to them ready-made from above, inscribed on stone tablets. Where I grew up, morality had a form, body and name. Cain, unremorseful Mary Magdalene, Ruth, Delilah, and Rachel. Morality was easily pointed at by a seven-year-old's ink-stained finger. Perfect examples of vice or virtue where time lays its eggs on a swamp. And so I received the first lessons in morality without chewing them, like cough syrup. Other things happened more abstractly and under a chaste roof. And strangely, even the second generation didn't disappoint. Their descendants became another Cain, another Ruth, another Mary Magdalene, who never grew up. Clichés were simultaneously risky and protective for them, like trying to use dry snow to make an igloo. Now I know so much more about morality. In fact, I actually could be a moralist, pointing my index finger out as a rhetorical gesture, but without referring to anyone. Where did everyone go? A door opened by accident. Light broke through by force 
and, as in a dark room, erased their silver bromide portraits, which were once flesh and bone. Mm. 